We're looking ahead to the French Open during very interesting times in the world of tennis. Plus, the WNBA is headed to Toronto. The Department of Justice could significantly alter the fan experience. And the NBA salary cap is poised to grow a lot. It's Friday, May 24th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The WNBA has announced its next city. Starting in 2026, the league will expand to Toronto. That team will be the league's 14th and the first outside of the U.S. The Golden State Valkyries will come in as the 13th team next year. By the way, Valkyries is an A-plus name choice. The Toronto team will have two homes. We've already seen WNBA teams adjust on the fly when they expect bigger crowds. The Washington Mystics and Las Vegas Aces, for instance, are moving their games this year against Caitlin Clark and the Indiana Fever to larger arenas. The Toronto team is going to work that basic arrangement into how it operates in general. The team will play most of its games at the Coca-Cola Coliseum, which is a 103-year-old venue with a capacity of 8,500. It is home to the AHL's Toronto Marlies. For some games, the WNBA team will move to Scotiabank Arena, home to the Toronto Raptors and Maple Leafs, which has a basketball capacity around 20,000. This kind of venue flexibility isn't something we're used to for major leagues, but it makes a ton of sense for a league that is growing quickly, but on most nights doesn't draw like the NBA just yet. The Department of Justice is taking action that could eventually make sports tickets cheaper. The DOJ is suing to break up the merger of Live Nation and Ticketmaster, claiming that the tie-up of the nation's largest events company and largest ticketing company creates an illegal monopoly that raises prices well above what a competitive market would produce. The legal filing states that, quote, Without competitive pressure to spur investment and innovation, customer service, website and app design, and product quality and stability suffer. These harms are the natural and predictable consequence of an industry suffocating under monopoly. Ticketmaster is the Ticketmaster for much of the live sports industry. The suit claims that held more than 70% of primary ticketing rights for NBA and NHL teams in 2022. The Biden administration has already pressured Ticketmaster into committing to include extraneous fees in the upfront price rather than its infamous practice of tacking them on right before you pay. The catalyst for the lawsuit may have been Taylor Swift, who put Ticketmaster in the headlines after fans struggled with the company to get tickets for her Eras tour. The force of her popularity has already altered the NFL schedule. Now it could make the games cheaper. The NBA projects a $141 million salary cap next season, and pretty soon that's going to look like nothing. The salary cap is calculated as a percentage of league revenues, and it can go up a maximum of 10% per season. With a new media deal expected to roughly triple the current one and bring in at least $7 million per season, you can expect the cap to go up by 10% per season for a while. Writer Kevin Smith crunched the numbers and found that at 10% annual growth, the cap would pass $200 million by the 2028-29 season. By that time, a five-year max deal would be worth $419 million with a fifth-year salary of $95 million. At some point, a player is going to get paid nine figures in a single year. I'm joined now by Catherine Whitaker and David Law, hosts of the Tennis Podcast. Welcome, Catherine. Welcome, David. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, great to have you on. So, uh, so we have the French Open starting this weekend. High level, how do you think about this tournament among the four majors? I feel like David should answer this first because it actually took David most of his career to go to the French Open for the very first wow. time. It was two years ago, almost to the day that David experienced Roland Garros for the first time. And his reaction to going there for the first time was one of my favorite moments as as a tennis podcast that we've ever had so i feel like david should should describe the experience yeah please yeah i had spent 30 plus years watching the french open on tv when i was at school when i was at college when i was working in a a job for 25 years that took place basically the week after the french open so i could never be there and then I got my chance representing the tennis podcast. We we all we all went there. Catherine, Matt Roberts, our third voice, and myself. And they'd been there before. They didn't really, I guess, know what the big deal was in terms of what I would see and what how I would react. And and I'd always regarded the French Open as being kind of the the poor relation amongst the four Grand Slams, probably because I'd never been. And and I just thought it's not going to be as big. It's not going to be as grand. It's not going to have the same vibe. And 
I was so wrong. I, I arrived and I was just enchanted by the place immediately, the style of it all, the, the passion for the sport, the colours, the, the, their own branding, but also the red clay and, and springtime in Paris. Honestly, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. And then I went back last year, I felt exactly the same, and I feel like I've been counting down ever since. Yeah. I mean, it does have um, <clears throat> this this unique feel, I mean, largely because it's on clay, right? I mean, it feels like the the very best tennis player, which is, you know, obviously um, not a fair distinction, but, you know, the, you sometimes think of it as like, it's not necessarily the best overall player who wins, it's the best clay player who wins. And, you know, it's a little unfair to say the best grass player is the best player, whereas the best clay player is just the best clay player. Um, anyway, how does that affect your experience you know that that red clay obviously visually it's different but uh what's the experience of taking in a match like on clay uh it's it's best if you have a comfortable seat i would say because <laughs> they, they can be long um wars of attrition i guess is is what you're conditioned to expect on clay mary carillo the well former former tennis player and uh mixed doubles french open champion but kind of even more famous as a as a broadcaster these days she calls clay tennis's classroom she says it's you know it's it's where players learn about themselves and about the sport there is something very um sorting the men from the boys about a clay court and yet yeah, the the specialism of the surface is one of the things that makes this time of the year so so intriguing. We have a world number one in the women's game, Iga Swiatek, who is so dominant on clay. She is as strong a favourite for this upcoming French Open as you will, as you will pretty much ever get in tennis. We're talking, you know, Serena Williams in her prime, Swiatek on clay. It is almost locked in, and yet she'll go to Wimbledon three weeks after the French Open, and she won't be expected to make the second week. She's never done it before. Mm. She's looked. She's looked all at sea on a grass court, and it really highlights the specific challenge of the surfaces. And it's, it's really cool, I think, as, uh, as people that are invested in the sport, because, you know, it's, a, it's an 11 month slog, the tennis calendar. If you didn't have those ebbs of flows and those points of difference, it could, it could all get to be a bit of a treadmill, but it, it kind of keeps us, keeps us entertained at every turn. And Roland Garros is, you know, it's the big holdout in terms of automated line calling. Do you think it you know, needs to kind of get with the times and uh, and take that step? Oh, I, I d- I'm business. interested in your opinion on this, David. I I think it's inevitable that it <laughs> it it will take that step. I think automated line calling everywhere, whether you like it or not, it, it's coming. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. I I think it's it's. It's been shown, it's been proved that it works on clay well enough. Maybe not perfectly, but frankly, the existing system isn't perfect either. When they're trying to figure out a mark that a ball makes in the the red dust, the red brick dust of a clay court, whether it's on a line or whether it's not, amongst all the footprints that players are depositing as they run about. I mean, that's not perfect either. And, and, and it's... It's been taking place this spring. It does work. It's efficient. There is something lovely and romantic in a way about the way it still happens in Paris. And, and I, I kind of appreciate their stubbornness and their, their desperation to cling to that tradition. But it's going to get overtaken by progress eventually. And I think that that it's not too far in the future. I agree with you, Catherine. Yeah, what I, what I would say, Owen, is they will hold out as long as they can because that is mm-hmm. that is what the French Open do. They were the last to offer equal prize money and they only did that when it was when it was kind of unavoidable for them to to do so. They were they were the 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 last tournament, the last Grand Slam tournament to remove the the net court ju- net court judges that sit there with they used to sit there with their hand on right, the tape, with their finger to, on the, right, on the net, yeah. to to feel for for whether um, the ball had hit the tape on the serve. Which, looking back now, it was only twenty years ago that they had that, but it looks so archaic. So, I think in their very French way, they'll hold out as long as possible before before the dam will inevitably burst. Yeah, and I think we know that because I 
as much as I can, you know, I can remember, you know, seeing like all those line judges in their spots and, you know, waiting for the call and it's kind of fun, but I don't, I don't miss it now when I watch, you know, the U S open or something. And it's like, you know, where are the judges? It's like, no, I'm just, I'm watching the tennis. And I think if there was something truly to miss there, um, you know, something really substantial, you know, I, at this point, I, I think it's just hard to have everyone at home knows the right call and they're still trying to figure it out, you know, 30 seconds later. It, it it feels like uh, they they should you know, at least be up to speed with everyone else watching the game. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I I I couldn't agree more on that. It's been we've had this sort of transition period where, as you say, the, the folks at home have got access to technology that the people on the court don't have, which seems absolutely wild. Yeah, yeah, um, um, and just well while, while we're here, uh, so yeah, you, you mentioned Iga Swiatek, um Nadal obviously is, you know, he's still playing, but he's, he's in his, his later years. Is there, um, on the men's side, do you see, uh, you know, an ex Nadal out there as someone who can kind of be the master of clay for, for the next generation? It doesn't feel like that to you, to me. Does it to you, Catherine? I mean, you know, first of all, Nadal is, that is not the norm. <laughs> you know, we, we yeah, might've right. got used to the fact that, that somebody can win 14, Grand Slam tournaments at the same place in the in a career because he's done it, but you know Bjorn Borg seemed like an outlier when he won six of them. That doesn't sound that many anymore, which is ridiculous because right. when I was a kid that was a lot. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, so I think the truth is we we are in a, a shifting generation right now. I mean, Catherine, how many how many players do you think realistically now that you could say, oh that that man could win Roland Garros and it wouldn't seem absurd. Right. This particular Roland Garros. Mm. Yeah. I mean, compared uh, we, to, you know, in the past it would be maybe two. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. That's but, the thing. This thing's been on, this thing's been on lockdown basically for Rafael Nadal with, you know, a possible um, party poop from, from Novak Djokovic for, for the past like 15, 20 years. And now suddenly yeah. we're entering a, a, a men's Roland Garros where, Frankly, I think there are probably 12 to 15 men where it's not ludicrous to think they could they could win this title, which, you know, after the era we've just had of the big three, you know, their stranglehold right. on the biggest tournaments just cannot be overstated. And of course, big four as well, when when Andy Murray was was in there, suddenly you've got this land of opportunity and some some guys are freezing at the prospect of that opportunity they don't seem able to grasp it it's going to be interesting to see who has the metal to do the grasping when the time comes because it kind of feels for a lot of guys like well if you can't win this one then you're probably not ever going to win one uh-huh yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm still getting used to the the post big three era. And when Alcaraz came in, I was like, okay, well, now it's him and Djokovic, and like it's just going to be one of them wins every tournament. And we're finding that that's not the case. And uh, you know, Alcaraz can lose in the second round, and you know, Djokovic at, at some point will probably retire. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of fun to have an open field, but at the same time, you know, my brain was just you know, calibrated toward it, it's going to be one of three guys, like once in a while, someone else wins it, but it's, you know, 80, 90%. It's, it's Djokovic, Federer, uh, Nadal. Um, so, and you know, you just get used to that dominance, um, because it, it was, you know, what, 10, 20 years of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, actually, go ahead. dominance for for a long for a long a lot of time is is a strength of a sport. The, these yeah. two or three people you can really say that they, they are the standard bearers. They are the the narrative to follow. Um, but I think people did grow a little tired of the same guy winning all the time, like the locals in Paris. I think they've they've warmed to him again now as he's shown his vulnerability. But um, yeah, there's, there are pros and cons to an open field, uh, but we're yeah. going to embrace the chaos. Yeah, I never really got tired of Federer, but yeah, eventually, um, yeah, yeah, it's like all right, we we could use some more names in there. Um, look into yeah the broader tennis world. We've got this big mainstream movie about tennis, Challengers, out right now. At the same time, Netflix canceled Breakpoint after two seasons. Do you have a sense of sort of how tennis plays as um, as a media project that goes beyond the court? That's a fantastic question. Well, look, uh, David's yet to see challenges. Uh, Matt and I were lucky enough to go to the UK premiere and we were 
kind of bracing ourselves for that because te- tennis movies don't have a history of being particularly good as movies or as good representations of tennis. And honestly, I, I not only really enjoyed it as a movie, I thought it was the best and most accurate depiction of the tennis world that that I'd ever seen on screen. And I would include Breakpoint in that. <laughs> I feel like... Oh, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I feel than, like... Better it, than reality? Yeah, I feel like it captured something essential um, about the the brutality of the tennis world that Breakpoint was never really able to. Now, I do think I, I cut the makers of Breakpoint a some amount of slack with the fact that I think it's an incredibly difficult sport to to capture in that format, you know, whereas Formula One Drive to Survive, you have 10 teams, 20 athletes. Um, you, it's easy for the sports governing body to to guarantee access to to those 20 athletes. It's it's pretty obvious how you how you cover that sport. You know, you have to cover every single Grand Prix. Tennis, some weeks it has sort of seven or seven or eight tournaments going on. You never know who's going to win that tournament in in advance. It is simply impossible to just assign a camera and a crew to every single player that has a chance of winning a, a tournament in a given week. Um, so they kind of had to gamble on who they were covering, and a lot of those gambles were ill advised. I think, but a lot of them they just got got pretty unlucky and a lot of them they made some pretty poor editorial decisions so um it pains me a bit that that breakpoint didn't wasn't more successful especially given how many of its rivals you know made by the same stable have been successful there is there's a finite number of eyeballs out there and if if full, full swing is doing great things for golf and getting people spending extra time watching golf that might be time people aren't spending watching tennis because Breakpoint didn't do didn't do the same for tennis. So I'm really glad that Zendaya has has lent her considerable star power to to tennis because we might need it right now. We might need it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And sort of speaking, state of the game type topic, but also a. Very different one. Uh, Saudi Arabia now has naming rights to the WTA rankings and the ATP rankings. WTA finals taking place in Riyadh. Not everyone's thrilled about this. It's pretty easy to make the case. This is this is sports washing. Um, at the same time, they're paying the sports washing tax and putting a lot of money in the sport. Big question, but how do you see the growing impact of Saudi Arabia in tennis? Well, I think to, to some degree it is inevitable and... Uh, I think we're increasingly just having to get used to that. I I think it's something we've wrestled with a lot on the tennis podcast is where do we stand on Saudi Arabia, given this is a a country that criminalizes homosexuality. um, The human rights record is, is abominable and, and, and hard to, to, to listen to and read about and, and, then think okay tennis is going into that and and just taking the money that that is a tough thing i think for us to get used to and and accept and and we're still far from comfortable with that um at the same time the wta in particular has got itself into terrible financial strife over the last few years it 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 got into business with china very very heavily then the pandemic struck. Then a, a a Chinese player seemed to go missing in Peng Shui, and and was certainly uh, certainly hasn't been seen much of her looking independent in the last uh, in the last couple of years. And the WTA took a massive stance against that and said that they will cease to do business with China if until they're comfortable that she's safe and well and and able to 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 be independent and free from from coercion and then they they did that for 18 months and then realized they couldn't frankly afford to do it anymore and they went back into business with china and they went and got involved in venture capital um and 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 now they've had this offer financial offer from saudi arabia and they've taken it um they've got to make money somewhere but it's it's a it's it's see it's a tough thing for us to accept that that place is saudi arabia yeah and yeah and we're talking about tennis as if it's like you know one thing uh i mean the wta i guess is one thing but 
it, it's you know it's a fragmented sport each athlete is is their own person each tournament is its own thing and um and so i think it just makes it that much easier to kind of pick off one thing at a time you say well if you're not going to take the money this one's going to take the money you know or you know the um and because there's so much money in that country in their public investment fund yeah i mean golf eventually said you know we're we're holding out but like they they can't hold out forever uh because it's even though they don't have any of the history they've got all the money in the world and so it's yeah i, I don't have any answers here because all those things you said about their human rights record are absolutely true yeah i feel like as soon as john ron rom flipped uh, everybody involved yeah. in sports everywhere just went oh okay <laughs> the game's up then yeah. everyone everyone's going to everyone's going to go yeah look i uh, we we famously give some pretty bad predictions on uh, on the podcast um i cut us a bit of slack on that because tennis is incredibly difficult to predict but i think one of my best predictions ever only good predictions was when the when the live golf thing first first emerged i i said on the podcast like of of course they're coming for tennis next. Like they would yeah. be mad not to go for tennis because fragmented is the word, Owen. Like there are seven different governing bodies over over mainstream tennis. Like that's not I mean, individual country governing bodies, you know, you could add a, a whole other basket in there, but tennis has seven different governing bodies and they barely agree on anything. The the internet sign warfare in tennis without um, Saudi Arabian influence is is pretty extraordinary. So enter Saudi Arabia and bags and bags of cash, and you've got a recipe for um, yeah for for takeover. I think it, it's felt inevitable, and yet I still that uh, I think the inevitability, the acceptance of the inevitability, has made it in, inevitable. It's been self fulfilling. You know, for a couple of years, the attitude has been, well, it's going to happen, so so why resist it? And I I don't personally go with that i do feel the need to resist it even if it feels futile i find it pretty pretty demoralizing but at this point it might well be inevitable yeah let's uh to end on a cheerier topic just what are you most excited for a player a uh, rivalry a narrative uh for for the roland garros at this tournament go ahead david well, there are so many players that I love to watch, probably none more so than Carlos Alcaraz. I find him to be one of the most exciting players I've ever seen. Um, I, I feel similarly on the women's side about Iga Swiatek and the, the rivalry that is developing with her and Irina Sabalenka and Elena Rybakina. Um, but the injuries, the, the question marks are making the rivalries more difficult to invest in. I think, you know, I thought it was all going to be Carlos Alcaraz and Yannick Sinner. We don't really know how fit they are. They, are, they have both suggested that they're going, that they're going to go and try and play. But actually the thing that's most interesting to me about Roland Garros is the unpredictability, the feeling that we're going to go there and Catherine and I'll be going there tomorrow and spending two and a half weeks there just following every twist and turn. And I just feel there's going to be a lot more twists and turns than we used to. And, and I'm, I'm kind of ready for that. Same. Me too. I'm settling in for a, a wild French Open and I, I'm ready to to lean into the chaos, as David says. But in amongst that, I would say I am looking forward with some trepidation to watching some greats play at Roland Garros for the last time. It will be Rafael Nadal's last Roland Garros if he's able to take to the court. I just hope that that's not a, a sad experience watching him there be a shadow of himself. I just hope he's able to put in a trademark Nadal performance, even if it doesn't result in in any victories. It's going to be Andy Murray's last Roland Garros. It's going to be Dominic Team's last Roland Garros. If he's if he's able to qualify, he was he was snubbed for a wild card extraordinarily by the French Tennis Federation. Um, so I'm going to make a point of making sure I savor seeing those three tennis players one last time on on the red clay and I'm probably going to have a traumatic uh, tear shedding time doing so, but I, uh, I won't regret it. All right. Catherine Whitaker, David Law, thanks so much for joining us on the show. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, I bet you've got a friend or two or three who would as well. So do them a favor and tell them about it. Thanks for listening. We'll be off on Monday for the holiday. So enjoy the long weekend. We will see you on Tuesday. Tuesday.